wherever you are right now, on your couch, in your favorite chair, at the table, or maybe even in your car, I want you to put your hands together right now and give God the praise because we are going to have church. Amen. friends and guests. It's another day's journey. Are you glad about it? I know I am. I'm so glad to be here on this glorious Sunday morning to praise and worship a God that does not lie. Because he does not lie, we can stand on his word and his promise that he will never leave us nor forsake us. That in and of itself is a reason to give a shout of praise. So come, go with me. Let's worship together at Calvary Sunday morning worship service. Welcome. Come on and make the joyful noise. Why you still have the chance? We come to praise His name. We come to clap our hands. We come to raise Him and lift His holy, His holy name. Before we start, I would like to tell everybody that I love you and I miss you and that I hope everyone is doing well through the pandemic, COVID-19 that we're going through. And know that God has us. This is the time that we can reflect with God about ourselves and get into a deep relationship with Him. And then witness to others how to do the same. So without further ado, I ask you to please get your Bibles, your cell phones, your laptops, your computers, and please turn with me to Proverbs chapter 2, 1 through 5, and it reads as follows. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding. Indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. May the Lord bless us all as the readers, the hearers, and the doers of his holy word. God bless. I'm so pleased to see that we, the Church of Calvary, is in touch with the Word of God through Bible study, Sunday school, prayer line, and in many other ways. And Pastor Moses, I just have to say, is doing a phenomenal job in these times of the coronavirus. This morning, I just want to share a little something with you that may help to motivate someone. You see, I know as Christians, we may be doing all we can, but someone may need just a little push. And sometimes we need to step out of our comfort zone and express our love for, and concern for someone else. Uh, just look around you. There's family, friends, neighbors, 
or just someone that needs a helping hand. The opportunities are there. And now sometimes we just close ourselves off and have a day with ourselves without interruptions. You know, I know I do, <laughs> but I'll do better. But I challenge you today to express some care and concern for somebody. Lend a helping hand and sometime, even money if necessary. We need to be an agent of God's love and the servant that God wants us to be. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's John 3, 16. You see, I'm wishing that everyone be careful and safe through these changing of times and understand that God is trying to tell you something. And let us pray for each other. Let us just pray for each other. And, 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 and let us be blessed. May God bless us all. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, Lord, our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you right now, Lord, giving you the thanks that, we, that you deserve, Lord. We ask that you come before us right now, Father, and bless us. Bless us for the things that, that is going on right now, Father. We ask that you heal our souls, Father. Touch us and be with us as we go along through this epidemic, Father. Oh, Lord, there's so many things that are happening in this world right now, Father, that we know that you have control over everything and you can straighten everything out, Lord. We just ask for your guidance and your help, Father. We thank you for the food that you've given us that we have in our homes as we stay at home, Father. We thank you for the water. We thank you for everything that you've given us, Father. We thank you for the, the, the times that you've given us to share with our families. We thank you for the time that you've given us to share with our friends. We thank you for everything, Father, because without you, we can't do a thing, Lord. And we ask that you be with us through these times, Father, go with us and stand by us. Take care of us, Father. For this serum that we have, we don't know if it'll work or not, Lord. But we know you have the answer, Lord. But it's just in, day, in due time. And we thank you and we wait patiently, Lord, because we believe and we trust in you. And we give you all the thanks and all the glory. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.
Jogging was viciously chased down, hunted down, and brutally murdered at the hands of two white men that proclaimed that he had committed a crime. The details around Aubrey's death are criminal, and they breathe of hatred and white supremacy. This is nothing new in the African American community. We're familiar with trauma. From slavery, through Jim Crow, through the civil rights, Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, the name go, names go on and on and on. Where do we get to a point where our voice speaks out so powerful that it is heard? Where we speak of the trauma that has been inflicted upon the African American community continuously. We can say that there needs to be a discussion, which is true, but there also needs, a needs to be a shift in where some of the discussion comes from. I think that we're living in such a time where the church is now being challenged to speak truth to power and to cry out injustice. How is that done? I'm not sure, but I believe that we will be led by God to do what he has assigned to our hands for such a time as this. For when the church stops seeking justice, when the church stops caring for those who have been marginalized and disenfranchised and victimized, then we're not mirroring the ministry of Jesus Christ. I want to pray today. I want to pray for the African-American community who has experienced this trauma and continuous trauma, I want to pray for the world and that God would bring healing to a world that is racially divided, bring healing to a world that is economically greedy, bring healing to a world where we are spiritually divided. Our Father in heaven, we come today on this Sunday morning. We pause to reflect on the life of Ahmad Aubrey and the countless others who have lost their lives to trauma, racism, and hatred. We pray for healing in the world, not only just healing from COVID-19, we need physical healing. We also need spiritual healing. And God, we pray for racial healing. We pray, oh God, for a revival within the church, that the church would come together on one accord for such a time as this, that we would be revived to speak truth to power and to put our faith into action. And then God, we pray for your word to go forth with power as countless of Sermons have been preached across Facebook, social media. We pray, O oh God, that it would penetrate even the hardest of hearts, that we would be receptive and responsive to what heaven is saying for these perilous days. It's in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen.
day it is to be alive. I've been waiting all week long to get to this word right here. I've been in the book of Psalm all week long, Psalm number 42. And this psalm uh, that we would attempt to preach about today is a psalm that we can look at when we can't get to church, when we're missing church, when we're thirsty to be with the believers one more time, to be in fellowship with one another. When we, the people of God, Come before the presence of God to experience the power of God. How do you navigate those waters? By social distancing. When social distancing commands that we cannot gather and we're missing the worship experience so much so that we're thirsty for it. There's a word I want to lift up. Are we ready? Aim fire. This is my Bible. There are many like it, but this one is mine. It is my weapon. It is my roadmap in enemy country. 
in my Bible is found the plan of salvation. Romans 10 and 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It is by our humility towards our Christ, hospitality within our congregation, hard work within our community, that the unsaved would be one to Christ. Amen and amen. The book of Psalms, let me say that the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms, their books, their numbers, their divisions, they're not chapters. The book of Psalms are not, does not consist of chapters. It consists of books, numbers, divisions. It is considered the Hebrew hymn book of the Old Testament. And such a powerful book, a testimony that the Psalms is. Uh, there's a word I want to lift up in Psalm 42. I've been praying over this, uh, this psalm all week long. It has been a sense of, of hope for me in times like these where we cannot get together. And I certainly, certainly pray that your hearts and your minds are open and receptive to what the word of God is saying in this psalm. Psalm number 42. I certainly pray that you have your Bibles, iPad, phone, whatever you use. I just want you to be reading along with us. Psalm 42, verses 1 through 5. Listen to the powerful words in this psalm. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirst, my soul thirst, my soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat night and day while they continually say to me, where is your God? Where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me for I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise. Let me go back. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise with the multitude that kept holy day. Why? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? For I shall yet praise him for the help of his continents. What a powerful word. May the grass, the grass may wither, the flower may fade, but the word of our God shall stand. Listen, I want to place a tag on this text uh, for preaching as the Holy Spirit will give me guidance on this day. Here's the tag. Good news for the soul when missing church. Good news for the soul when missing church. I want to put a subtitle on this. Now, you got to get ready for this. Hold on to your seats. Here's the subtitle. Stay thirsty, my friends. Stay thirsty, my friends. When Sunday comes, that was a tune that came out in the mid-1990s, a gospel song recording by the late Durrell Coley uh, with his melodic, silky, smooth voice, such a balladeer that's missed tremendously from the gospel field. He wrote that song, When Sunday Comes, and it connected believers to the worship experience. It connected believers to the experience of being with the people of God, in the presence of God, yes, and experiencing the power of God. Coley wrote that song, and it's very genuine and very unique because it describes the edification and how we are built up just by being in the presence of God. He says, when Sunday comes, all of my burdens, all of my trials, all of my tribulations. I got a new song on Sunday because when Sunday comes, every misery, every disappointment is rolled away when Sundays come. When church leaders all over the country uh, had to close the church, it created such a situation in the life and the faith of people that were used to connecting and coming together and experiencing the worship experience. One pastor, Pastor Paul J. Jones uh, from the Clearview Church in uh, Pennsylvania says that uh, closing churches are counterintuitive, particularly in the African-American community, particularly because after we have been racially 
profile after we have been uh, experienced trauma. He says, after we have gone through all that we've gone through historically, the church is the one place that we gather to have a sense of safeness. It was the one place that was the harbor uh, for the soul where we came together uh, co corporately and that we would experience and enjoy one another in worship. It was a, so a sociologist by the name of Jason uh, Shelton. And Jason Shelton says that the church for African-American uh, people has been the institution where they found power and where they found a sense of belonging after being denied from every other institution. When Sunday comes, when you're dealing with racism on the job or you're dealing with strife and you're dealing with pressure or sickness, we enjoy being together with the people of God in the presence of God. And yes, experiencing the power of God. But this COVID-19 has gave, given us a new normal. And so the question for us today is how do we handle life when we cannot get into the sanctuary, when we're thirsty for that fellowship, we're thirsty for worship, we're thirsty as the people of God to be in the presence of God and to experience the power of God. Well, there's good news this morning. And I want to place that tag back on this text. And I want to talk about good news for the soul that misses church. Good news for the soul that misses church. Stay thirsty, my friends. Stay tuned. Psalm 42 is a psalm to the chief musician for the sons of Korah. The chief musician writes this psalm as a maskil. And scholars agree that a maskil is a teaching psalm. It is a psalm of instructions that tells us what to do in a given situation. Korah was the one who led the rebellion against the people of God, against God, in Numbers chapter 16, and was killed. His sons escaped that rebellion, escaped being killed, and became worship leaders. Eleven psalms are contributed to the sons of Korah, this being one of them. Scholars believe that one of the sons was perhaps the worship leader who had retired or had been uh, had resigned from his position as a worship leader. And now, for whatever reason, he's denied access back to the sanctuary where the presence of God was, where the Ark of the Covenant was. He can't get back and social distancing, if you will. And he's depressed because what he once knew in that sanctuary, what he remembered, he cannot now attain to. And so he laments, he he bears his his, his pain in this psalm. Listen to the words of, in this psalm. Uh, let me give you my trans, translation. He says, as the heart panteth after the water, brook, so panteth my soul. My soul after thee, O God. My soul is thirsting for the living God. My tears have been my meat night and day. I don't want food. All I do is weep. My tears have been my meat night and day while they, the critics say to me that knew that I had a relationship in the sanctuary. Where is your God now? Where is he? And the psalmist says, when I remembered those things, the days that we went back in the sanctuary and we praised God. When I remembered the day that we on a Sunday morning, O.T. Moses translation. When I remembered how we lifted up our voices in together in the sanctuary, my soul was painful. It was hurt within me. And then the psalmist changes the conversation and he talks to his soul. He says, why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? And then he answers himself and he says, hope Thou in God. He closes this psalm by saying, saying that even though I am not in the sanctuary, even though I've been distanced from the sanctuary, even though I've been denied access, and even though my critics are talking about me, listen to how he closes the psalm. He says, I will yet praise him for the help of his countenance. I see three movements in this text. Let me give them to you, give you three points 
sit down and shout my own self happy. The first movement in this text that the psalmist lifts up to us is this thought. He's distanced from the well and he's deprived of water. Watch that. He's distanced from the well and he's deprived of water. He says, as the heart panted after the water brook, so panted my soul after thee, O God. The psalmist is comparing his soul to the, that of a heart. A heart is a, dun, a, a young deer who usually thrives somewhere around uh, where there's a body of water, where he has vegetation and he can feed off the land. But in the event that the predator comes, that he has that body of water that he could take to for refuge. And so the image or the illustration that the psalmist gives here is that this young heart, this young deer is being pursued by a predator, perhaps a hungry pack of wolves, and he's distanced from the water. <laughs> he's distanced from the water and he's panting to get to the water. And when the deer or the young heart gets to the water, he goes all the way out to the middle and submerges himself in the water with only his nose sticking out to get away from his predator. The psalmist is saying, this is how I feel. My soul feels like this heart that has been panting for the water, to get to the water, to get to the worship, to get back to the house of God. My soul is thirsty for the living God. This, that's the first movement in this text. He's distanced from the well. He's deprived from water. But there's another movement in this text. He is depressed by his circumstances and he's despised by his critics. Watch the movements in the text. He says, my tears have been my meat night and day. He's not crying. He's weeping. Uh, the, the Hebrew word for tears does not uh, connotate crying. It means weeping. It means lamenting, lamenting. Crying is different than weeping. Crying could be a cry out for injustice. But weeping is when your soul has been touched. And he says that my tears have been my meat night and day. I'm, I'm depressed by my circumstances. I'm not able to get back into the sanctuary. I'm not able to be with the people of God in the presence of God, to experience the power of God. And yet, although I'm depressed by my circumstances, I'm being despised by my critics. Watch what he says in verse five. And they said continually to me, where is thy God? No doubt they knew that he had a relationship where he was familiar with being in the sanctuary. And now the critics are despising him. Where is thy God? That's the second movement in the text. But the third movement in the text is this. Although he is distanced from the house of God, he's dependent upon his hope in God. I think I said something. He's distanced from the house of God, but he's dependent upon the hope in God. He cannot get to the sanctuary. He's denied access to the sanctuary. And he says, why art thou cast down? That word cast down, it literally means that he has been depressed. Why art thou quiet, disquieted, tumultuous, commotion in his soul? But he says, even though I'm distanced from the house of God, I'll have hope in God. I'm dependent upon that because he turns the conversation back on himself and he says, hope thou in God. Hope thou in God and I will yet praise him. Here it is for the help of his conscience. I'm preaching this because we have to be careful how we navigate life during a COVID-19 situation. We have to be careful that our souls have a maintenance plan, that when life happens to us and that when life has a way of touching our very souls, that we must have a soul maintenance plan. Listen, I can get preaching out of a rock and every now and then the Lord would allow a snatch of a phrase to arrest me and just wrestle with me all week long. This past week, my wife and I were watching um, Netflix and we were watching Michelle Obama's uh, documentary, great documentary, uh, Becoming. And in that documentary, she described how the eight year journey in the White House with her and Barack Obama was a challenge and how cruel people could be and how hard circumstances could be. She talked about her critics, uh, Barack's critics and the, and the public criticism that was given towards her. And then 
she said these words that arrested me and my wife right in our tracks. She said, you must be careful how you deal with life circumstances like that because they could change the shape of your soul. Did you hear that? It can change the shape of your soul. And that suggests to me uh, this morning, brothers and sisters, that we need to be careful how we respond to the inequities of life. We have to be careful how we uh, respond to the vicissitudes, the trials of life, the tribulations of life, that we don't lose the shape, the God shape of our, of our soul. The soul is different than the spirit. The spirit is, is that which connects us to God, but the soul is who we are. It's the essence of our personality. It is our integrity. The soul is who we are, the, the person, who we are that forgives, the person that cares or not cares, the person that forgives or not forgive, the person with integrity or no integrity. That's the essence of who you are. And in times like this, there's good news for the soul that's missing church. Because the Bible says that in Genesis 2 and 7, the God created the breath of life into us and we became a living soul. Here's the question. How do you handle life during the times when we are socially distancing ourselves from the sanctuary where we are deprived of being with the people of God in the presence of God? And yes, experiencing the power of God. How do you handle life when you can't get up and go to church? As Daryl Coley says, when Sunday comes all of our burdens are rolled away. It's the time when the people of God corporately come before him and we bring the little gods that we've made before the God that has made us. How do you handle life when you're not able to join in with praise and worship because we come into the sanctuary to glorify God for us to be edified to go back out to strengthen someone else? What do you do when your soul is missing? The church. Listen to what the psalmist says, and we're done. He says that in the in the event that life happens and your soul has been disfigured by life circumstances, the first thing you got to do, wake up and write this down, is stay thirsty, my friends. Stay thirsty, my friends. Go after the water. That's what the illusion is in the text that we would go after the water. What is the water? Isaiah 55 and 1 makes it clear. Ho, everyone that thirsts, come ye to the water. The woman in John chapter 4 at the, at the well was given an education on what the water really is. Jesus sees that she's de deprived of spiritual water and that she's spiritually thirsty. And Jesus says to the woman at the well, if you drink of this water, and no doubt he was pointing down at Jacob's well when he said that. He said, if you drink of this water, you'll be thirsty again. And brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, there is that which appears to be quenched to our thirst that cannot quench our thirst. We try to fill our lives with everything to quench the thirst when only Jesus can fulfill that thirst. Jesus says, if you, if you drink of this water, no doubt you'll be thirsty again. But if you drink of the water, I have to give... You'll never thirst again. Stay thirsty, my friend. Jesus is the water. He is the word. He is that which we need to sustain us in times like this. Stay thirsty for Jesus. Not only does this text, number one, I suggest that we stay thirsty. Tell somebody, stay thirsty, my friend. Come on, tell somebody, stay thirsty, my friend. But the second thing this text suggests for us to do is to have a conversation with ourselves. Look at what the psalmist does. He's depressed. He is deprived. He is distanced from the sanctuary of God. His tears have been his meat night and day. Tears has been his meat night and day. And he says, why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted? Disquieted means tumultuous, tumult or or commotion. And why art thou disquieted within me? Then he says to himself, he answers himself, hope thou in God. I like what Lloyd Jones said about this verse. He says that often, oftentimes the problem is we're listening to ourselves 
instead of talking to ourselves. Every now and then you have to talk to yourself in times like this. When 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 we're listening to ourselves uh, saying that this is the end of the road when we're listening to ourselves saying it's not going to get any better. There are times when you have to say self, huh? You can do better than this. Tomorrow's going to be a brighter day. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Self, that God is in control. Self, we know that all things are working together for good. To those who love God and to those who are the call according to his purpose. Self, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Self, fret not thyself because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down. Number one, stay thirsty, my friend. Number two, have a conversation with yourself. Number three, here it is. Give them something to talk about. <laughs> it's in the text. I promise you it is because the text suggests to us that he's being despised by his critics. Ah, he's being despised by his critics. And he closes the text by saying, and yet will I praise him? I'm about to take off running. And yet will I praise him? In other words, the word yet simply means a, before a situation comes to fruition. In other words, he says, I'm going to have an about to praise. And, and brothers and sisters, this is what the text is suggesting to us, that we need to learn how to embrace an about to praise. An about to praise simply says, God hasn't did it yet, but he's about to. <laughs> Things haven't turned around yet, but an about to praise says that I know that he's about to do something. He says, yet will I praise him for the help of his countenance, for the help of his countenance. In the Hebrew translation says, by the strengthening of his face. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord have his countenance to smile upon you. And the countenance or by the help of his countenance simply means the favor of God. Favor ain't fair, but the show feels fabulous. It lets me know that in my weakness, in my, in my depravity, in my low moments, that God's grace will augment and supplement our weaknesses. That God steps in at the moment that we cannot bear the weight any longer. And here it is, that the help of his confidence will brighten my confidence, that I might be stronger. Listen. This is a powerful text because the text is telling us to stay thirsty. The text is telling us simply have a conversation with yourself. The text is telling us give them something to talk about. Give your critics something to talk about. Praise God in advance, even before we get back inside of the sanctuary. Praise him right where you're at. The praise of God is not legislated or relegated to the church. We can praise God, God in our line of the grocery store. Praise him in our attic. You can praise him in your basement. You can praise him at your kitchen table. Wherever you're at, God is worthy to be praised. I've kept you long enough. But I want to kind of taxi around the runway because I want to direct this flight towards a cross on Calvary. Several years ago, I guess around 2006, media uh, came out with a, a very interesting commercial. It was uh, a Dos Equis commercial. And the character was a 70-ish grain mature man that they called the most interesting man in the world. And it was a very attractive. It was a very um, uh, funny, exciting commercial because you would see the greatest man or the most interesting man in the world wrestling alligators and you would see him shooting pool somewhere on an Indian reservation. You would see him in South America arm wrestling somebody. And at the end of the day, he would always be at this around some lounge area with all these pretty women around him. And he says, 
Uh, I don't drink beer much, but when I do, I drink Dos Equis. And he closes his statement with these words. Stay thirsty, my friend. I see preaching all over this, so we've taxied long enough. Let's let's go direct flight to Calvary now, because this interesting man, the Dos Equis man, is fictional, fictional. But let's direct the Calvary flight towards Calvary, where the most interesting man in the world is factual. And he lived a tremendous life and died a tremendous death on the cross of Calvary. He's the most interesting man in the world. He was able to give sight to the blind. He was able to unstop deaf ears and stammering tongues. He was able to turn water into wine. He was able to raise the dead. He was able to turn two little fish and five loaves of bread into a moving mobile buffet on the side of the wilderness. I'm talking about the most interesting man in the world who on the cross of Calvary made one of the most interesting statements. I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. And that arrested me that the most interesting man in the world would say, I'm thirsty because after all, he said to the woman at the well, I am water. How can water get thirsty? When Jesus on the cross of Calvary gets thirsty, how is that good news for the soul that misses church on Sunday? How do we stay thirsty? I need to tell you that Jesus was thirsty on the cross of Calvary because God cut the water supply off. And Jesus had to be deprived of water that we might have water for everlasting life. He had to be deprived of water. He became thirsty on the cross of Calvary because he died vicariously for your sins and mine. But oh, when Sunday come, like Daryl Coley said, on that Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hand, a full flowing fountain of water. Go after the water. I pray that you were blessed by that word on today. Good news for the soul that misses church. Stay thirsty, my friend. I don't want to take for granted that everyone listening has a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And perhaps you, you may not even be sure that if you died tonight, would your soul be saved? Well, the Bible does give us indeed the plan of salvation. That thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That simply means that you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary for sins that you have committed or sins you will commit. And that his death, the blood that he shed was payment for our sins. That we believe that he died in our place. He died vicariously. That means he took our place. He was buried in a borrowed tomb on the third day morning, he rose with all power in his hands. And he now sits at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and for I. Perhaps you don't have a church home, you can call your own. Calvary is a great church, a mission-centered church, a church that also embraces a Christian family value system that governs how we conduct ourselves in the home, in the church, and in the world. In the weeks to come, we'll have uh, our ministers will be available uh, to take phone calls for those of you that need to be got, need to be guided through the process of joining Calvary Baptist Church. Be prayerful for us. Uh, the Lord is being very creative, strategic, and intentional with us as He uses us for such a time as this. I want to encourage you to become a part of our Calvary War Bible Study, which takes place every Tuesday at 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Our CSI ministry team, the Creative Strategic Intentional Ministry Team, they are for not they are phenomenal. Uh, they have facilitated groups with uh, group leaders and facilitators, and the Bible study is growing. And so we thank God for our CSI team and those of you that have participated. Uh, this week we are continuing in part two of spiritual battle for such a time of this, and we're looking very deeply at Ephesians six as we learn. Uh, the weapons of our armor, of our spiritual warfare. And so I certainly pray that you would be a part of our war Bible study on this Tuesday from 7 to 8 p.m. You can look at our Calvary Facebook page and look at the groups and see how you can become a part of the Bible study experience. Also, I want to thank Deacon Jack Hesliff for championing a project that we are bringing forth 
uh, called the uh, Calvary Baptist Church COVID-19 Relief Initiative. Uh, we're sponsoring this relief initiative uh, to help members of Calvary, but, but for also those in the greater community uh, that could benefit from um, some of the things that we want to offer during this COVID-19 pandemic. The outreach um, initiative will be June the 6th, 2020. It will start at 10 a.m. and it will go to 1 p.m. You could be a, a, a part, an important part of this initiative uh, by donating the following items, uh, which has been listed on our Calvary website. But uh, you can participate by donating canned goods, beans, fruits, meats, chicken, tuna, canned goods, uh, vegetables, dry goods, uh, rice, beans, noodles, etc., and paper goods, toilet, toilet paper and paper towels and things of that nature. Donations have already started to come in, uh, but you can contact the church, Calvary Baptist Church, and between the hours of 10 and 1, we will be receiving donations. And just a word of caution, we still are practicing social distancing and we want to be socially responsible. And so as we come to drop off our uh, canned goods and our donations, we, we don't want to mingle. We want to drop off the canned goods and donations and then we want to leave. So please honor our request in that regard so that we may be socially responsible um, in that way. Please contact Calvary for further information uh, between the hours of 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. And we thank you once again for your support. I want to thank those members of Calvary over and over again. I cannot thank you. Uh, we are so appreciative for a church that believes in the Bible. And the Bible does not give us the suggestion to give our, or bring our tithe and offerings, but it is a commandment that we pay our tithe and offerings. So, Calvary, I want to thank those members that have been consistent, and I'm asking that we would all be consistent. I also want to thank those who are not members of Calvary who have made some financial contributions. We greatly appreciate it, and we thank God for your contribution. After uh, this airing, there will be a list of apps where you can uh, make your financial contribution. I personally have used Givelify, uh, but others have dropped off their financial um, givings by either mail or just drop it off at the church. So let's be, remain consistent in that way. I pray that you have a great week. I pray that uh, our souls will have been fed by the word of God. And I want to leave you with these parting words. Stay thirsty, my friend. Peace. Falling in love with Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Falling in love with Jesus is the best thing I've ever done. Oh, yes, Lord. In his arms, I feel protected, Lord, Lord, Lord. In his arms, never Never disconnected, no. In his arms, I feel protected, and there's no place I'd rather be. Mm, yeah. Falling in love with Jesus. Lord, 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 I'm falling in love with Jesus, yeah, yeah, I'm falling in love with Jesus is the best thing I've ever done, Lord. In his hands, there is 
so much power oh, 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 in his hands. I'm protected every hour, yes. In his hands, there is so much power. He got a whole, whole power. He's got all, all power. He's got all, all power. In his hand. Good afternoon, Calvary. It's time to celebrate our 2020 graduates. Please send your information to Christian Education at CalvarySLC.com. That's for all graduating seniors from high school and college, as well as those who are being promoted from different grades. Again, send your information to Christian Education at CalvarySLC.com. Congratulations, graduates. Good morning from Pastor Oscar T. Moses and the members of the Calvary Missionary Baptist Church in Salt Lake City, Utah. Would like to send a heartfelt appreciation and thank you to the many wonderful first responders. We want you to know how much we appreciate you for putting your lives on the line for us every day for you taking a hit for us, for what you are doing for us, for jeopardizing your lives for us, for the difficulties you face every day. To the medical profession, thank you. To the U.S. postal workers, thank you. To the grocery store workers, thank you. To the pharmacists, thank you. To the fire departments, thank you. The police departments, thank you. To those who make sure the first responders are fed, thank you. To custodial and building staff, thank you. To everyone for everything, thank you. God bless you for all you've done and what you'll continue to do. We will continue to do what we know we should as appreciation to you for your sacrifice. We will continue to stay home when we can. We will continue to wear our masks and gloves, keep our distance, wash our hands and sanitize. This too shall pass. May God bless us all. Thank you from all hearts of Calvary Missionary Baptist Church. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you and worship you. We pray for those first responders who put themselves on the front lines to help the victims and give them comfort. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you continue to wrap your loving arms around our first responders and give them strength, encouragement, love, and the desire to keep moving forward. Watch over and protect everyone who has been impacted by the COVID-19 virus. Lord, be with all those involved. We love you and we know that you are God and God alone. We know that there is power in your name. In Jesus' name, I pray this prayer. Amen.